Welcome to The Jury Is Out, a podcast for trial attorneys who want to sharpen their skills and better serve their clients. Your co-hosts are John Simon, founder of the Simon Law Firm, and St. Louis attorney Eric Veith. Welcome to another episode of The Jury Is Out. I'm Eric Veith. Sitting across the table from me today is Tim Cronin. Hey, Tim. Hey, Eric. How are you? Thanks for having me on. Thanks for joining us again. We had an episode not too long ago where we talked about the opioid epidemic and the Coon case. If folks listening in today want to know more about that, that was a good episode. I certainly learned a lot from you, but welcome back. Oh, thank you very much. And we have Tim Gearin here with us, which is an attorney we have the pleasure of button heads with on plenty of cases. And Tim works on opioid cases too, so he knows all about that topic. So Tim, welcome. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks for joining us. There's a number of reasons you're here, but we received an email from someone saying, hey, you guys ought to have a defense attorney on. And we were thinking, John, Simon and I were saying, uh, we do. That's important for us to hear a lot of perspectives and to share a lot with the audience. And there's a lot of you guys out there. You're with the Armstrong Teasdale firm, Give us your you know, career arc as far as maybe when you decide to be a lawyer and then just take us up to where you are today. Well, we'll try and do it in five sentences, which is what we advise our witnesses to once they go beyond five sentences to put a period after the next word because you've gone on too far. Born in St. Louis, grew up in North County, was a registered nurse for about 12 or 13 years, during which I went to the evening program at St. Louis University. And then I've been a lawyer since 1993. Was lucky enough to take care of a lawyer who was a uh, principal at a defense law firm. When he had some medical problems, we struck up a friendship and I became a clerk and then latched on and then later came up to Armstrong Teasdale when there was a move of some lawyers. So predominantly, I represent healthcare providers in really any aspect of their litigation. Probably about 75% of what we do is professional liability where somebody accuses somebody of negligence. But the other 25% is for healthcare providers is anything that a healthcare provider gets sued for. Commercial litigation, IP, different areas of law. And then we also do some toxic tort exposure cases where we do defense. And we have a large team of people that work with us. Dave Ott and Maureen Bryan are the two partners who kind of head our team. And we have probably about, oh, maybe about 15 lawyers and paralegals working on our cases. It keeps us busy. All of us are trying to do what we were trained for, practice law. But when you've got a team that size and that diversity of cases, it just seems like the challenges of coordinating with your team making sure everyone's doing what they're most productive at, communicating fluidly, getting the job done with everybody knowing what's going on next. It seems like a real challenge. Why don't you talk a bit about how you keep the team working as a whole? Well, I will say one of the benefits of COVID, the only benefit that we learned from COVID was we were able to meet more frequently and we meet on every case at least every three weeks. Cases that are going to trial, we meet weekly on. We have very quick meetings and very goal-oriented where we say what, basically there's a couple of concepts we discuss. What did we say we were gonna do? Did we do it? And what do we need to do? As I approach a case, those are the three things that I'm interested in. And if we're not doing what we said we were gonna do, why? And then we need to do it. We have a lot of, I think, a really talented team. We have a deep bench. That's how we do it. It's really over communication, frequent communication. I say there's too many emails, but we have to have emails so that we're aware of what's going on on all the files. And it's also important to be in front of the judges in court and talking with uh, lawyers on the other side so that they know that we're invested. And so, Tim, you have different columns of people that can work on different cases. How many cases do you have to know what's going on in at a time? Probably if we exclude toxic tort cases where there's hundreds or perhaps thousands of cases. So if you take those aside, probably about 90 to 100 cases, varying wildly on complexity, but our cases tend to be more catastrophic injuries. So that's why we have a lot of senior lawyers that are are able to make decisions 
that we trust their judgment. And then they have assistance from good associates and good paralegals. But the clients, you know, the expectation is, you know, when they call, they call a case over. They know that we have a very active practice, a vibrant practice, and we can't be everywhere at all times. So we have really good people who work with us. I'm just fascinated with the time management issues and how to keep the focus, yet keep coordinating with your team. I don't work well all day long talking. If I need time alone. Yeah. And a lot of, I assume you too, that there's times where you got to shut off the world and focus on something. How do you do that balance? You have a room you go into, right? I, that nobody can bother you in right? yeah, when it, you're learning. You it's called the bat cave and it's actually my car. <laughs> whatever car that I have. And my strategy when I do need to have time alone or particularly for trial where it's right before trial, the crunch time, is I will get in my car and I've always had some type of SUV of some sort and I will get everything on my file that I need to read for that day and I will go pick a park in the area. I'll get a soda and I'll work until I get a little bit tired. I'll take a quick walk and I turn my phone off. But people know where I'm at. They know that I'm in the back cave, wherever that is. And the nice thing is, is the back cave moves around. It could be in the city, it could be anywhere. And that's what I love about it. You know, I, I had somebody ask me the other day, maybe a couple months ago, how many hours do you work a week? When you talk about time management, I answered, I don't know. I don't think of the profession of law as a number of hours that you work per week. You just work as much as you need to work. You need to take the time off that you need to take off to keep your mind fresh, to keep your body fresh. And it is whatever it is. I have no idea how many hours that I work. Well, I'm sure it ends, ebbs and flows too. Yeah. Over the last 10 years, I'd say, Tim, you probably try more cases than anybody else in the city, but I'm sure you make a point to try to take off. If you have a couple months where you're not going to, for mental health reasons, take off yeah. a little bit of time. Well, for you, I'm sure it's the same way. Most of the time, vacations are when a case resolves, gets settled, and then you have a block of a week to two weeks. So I always try to take, if a case settles, I usually try and take that time and we go somewhere. And I like that. I like that. It's unexpected. It's quick. And uh, there seems to be a few of those that happens a couple of times a year. Yeah, I try to get the chance, grab my wife, go to Chicago for three, four days. We've all talked about talking about this, the stress of being a lawyer and how it sometimes manifests in our relationships with each other. We've all had sessions where it got tense and where emotions together, uh, together. Yeah. Tim uh, and I have been in each other's throats a few times, but I think we've I mean, I hope I've gotten a little better at, you know, once the depot or the hearing is over, being able to put that aside. But yeah, we've all had some tense moments together. A lot of friends will say, well, how do you not hate each other all the time when you're disagreeing in court? And a lot of the time it works really well. We're trained to focus on the case, to keep the focus moving on, not becoming personal. It's an adversarial system. We're adversaries. It doesn't mean we have to be enemies. But sometimes it's hard to remember that. And I, I bet... All of us in this room and many others who do this well know that they've made some of their best friends across the aisle, you know, by meeting somebody in a case, beating each other up in court, and then you go out for a beer or whatever, and you can become good friends. And a lot of people on the streets don't understand that right. that really does happen a lot. It's important to remember, I try to remind myself, and I forget sometimes, Tim's seen me do it, I lose my temper, but I increasingly try to remember, oh, they care just about as much about their client as I do about mine. And if you can keep that in your mind, then I think it allows you to see it a little bit more healthy perspective. And I think the clients sometimes have difficulty, our clients have difficulty understanding that collegial relationship we have. And for instance, tried a case several years ago where when we were in the well of the courtroom in front of the judge, in front of the jury, it wasn't with your law firm, it was with another law firm, a very good law firm. And it was uh, knives and, and rocks and whatever you could throw or hit or whatever. And then as soon as the whistle blew and the jury wasn't there, even in front of the judge, we would smile at each other, shake hands or tell a joke. Well, the client, the doctor that I represented had difficulty with that. He was so wrapped up in the fight 
that he couldn't turn it off. And after the trial was over, wrote me a letter and said, the only thing I didn't like was that you shook hands with the other lawyer after the case was over and that you, you know, were friendly with him. I called him and I said, look, we talked about it. Sometimes you forget that. And this was your case. This was a personal attack on you. But I'll work with that lawyer in the future on other cases. So yes, we'll fight when we're in the well of the courtroom. We conduct ourselves professionally, but we will battle. But when we're outside the well of the courtroom, that battle shouldn't take place. But even with you guys, Eric and Tim, that battle is taking place. And, and I remember an instance where it bled over. And there was a case that we had that another law firm had lost a case. And you guys were hired as appellate counsel and you were successfully able to obtain a new trial from the Court of Appeals. And let me just tell you, that is, as a lawyer, when someone comes in and says, the opinion is down on the Smith case, it's printed, I went into a room, and then I read the opinion, and I saw, okay, we just had the case remanded for back to a trial. So... Yes, that is hard to get over. It is hard to read those things. And it bled over into when we were arguing, we were outside, I call it the ante room, right outside the courtroom. And I think I had Mr. Ott, Dave Ott, my partner with me, and we were trying to work on discovery objections. And I can still remember Tim Cronin. It's the saying, first time we met. It was the first time we met. Tim <laughs> saying, you're just mad that <laughs> we got the case overturned. And I just said to you, and I may have had an F-bomb in there, you're right. You're effing right. I'm mad, and I'm still mad. Yeah, but then you got to win the case again, Tim. <laughs> well, but we didn't know that was going to happen. I know, I That's know. why it's a fun story for me. Yeah. <laughs> and then we were mad. Yeah. <laughs> then you were mad. But... That's just, you're right, Tim. It's the heat of the moment. We try to set it aside. But I was mad. I wasn't mad at you. I was mad. No, but I was poking you. Yeah. You were poking when you, the when bear. It, when you were already mad. And so I shouldn't have done that. But then you got to win the case again. That's true. <laughs> That's true. There isn't anything worse than trying a case a second time. We've all had to do that. I've had to do that a few times. But it gets us to the spot where we're at today, which is, I think, is a good position. And I think we both try to make... And not just you and I, I think other people at the firm, too, try to make an effort. Like, I, I think I called you in the middle of COVID just to see how you were doing. You did. Last year. And those kinds of things are important to keep a good relationship. And remember, just because we're on the other side of cases doesn't mean we have to be enemy. You did. And that was a welcome call. And I find that after I've lost cases, and I have lost a few cases in my career, and most of the time, the uh, condolence calls come from the plaintiff's bar. I don't get a lot of calls from defense lawyers saying, oh, you know, too bad. You just lost. My team has lost big money to you guys, but it's nice to get those calls. And when we do lose a case, I can honestly say that in the later years, when I drive home after a loss, I can say to myself, boy, we left it all on the field. Yeah, We did everything we possibly could. And I have a mental note when I'm done, after I sit down from a closing argument and I sit down and I've heard everything other than rebuttal, I feel like if I haven't heard during the trial, if I haven't heard something that surprised me, something new, then I've done my job. Yeah. And I usually write a note, I'm done, other than stand up and maybe make an objection. How frustrating must it be, Tim? To know that you're done, you have to sit down, you don't get to talk again, and we get to get up again, and you don't get to respond. Well, you've heard me say it. I usually say to the jury, I'm going to sit down, shut up, and set your jaw. And I do. I try and focus on something in the room, keep my ears open for, you know, in case something is said beyond what it should be. But the bottom line is that's the time where, under the law, that we have to take it. You know, we have to really take it, and you just have to sit down, shut up, and set your jaw. When you guys do your job, the floors are going to rattle and the, the walls will rattle and the floors will shake. So it's coming. <laughs> it's coming. We see your fastball in rebuttal. <laughs> That's what we say. Don't go throwing change-ups. Yeah. Now's the time for your fastball. There's a psychologist named John Gottman who talks about marriage relationships. And I think there's a lesson to be drawn from that. And it's basically you build up a buffer of a relationship and then you can survive 
the stuff that happens that challenges you much better. So if you go into a, a trial or a deposition with someone you've never met and they start getting prickly or you do, it can escalate real fast. And I find that that happens much less if you actually have a relationship with the other attorney before you start. Right. And you've been through stuff. Maybe you know some things about each other's families or you talk about even the weather or anything that a relationship will help you weather these storms. And they're big storms. I mean, obviously a lot at stake financially, reputation. These are hard things to survive with poise. But is that your experience too when you're with people, you know? It is. And that's why in our relationship, I say our, I mean my team's relationship with the Simon Law Firm. We've tried a lot of cases with your law firm and hit a rough patch with you guys in the last couple of years because of litigation, because of us both, both sides taking things and not leaving it on the field. And I think we're working through those issues right now because they shouldn't have any effect on what we're doing now. I mean, we really do respect each other. Just in other cases, we've taken positions, you've taken positions that anger us. You know, I know there's a case. John Simon was angry at the position that I took in defending the case. And then in a, in a case that followed, I, I was angry at some of the things that happened in that case. But we've worked through it. But never during that time did I ever lose respect for anybody at your law firm. I just was mad. Yes, like you're mad at somebody and, right. and hope that in the future, that'll get repaired and really a belief, a true belief that, you know what, time will heal these wounds. And maybe it, you're right, Tim, we're both got Irish tempers and, right. and very quick fuses. And I think in the times that we've had rough patches, I've always thought, okay, just got to let a little time go by. I mean, it's the nature of the types of cases we work on. We're not trying $10,000 slip and falls against each other. You know, they're big cases with a lot of issues and a lot's at stake. And so we both get very, very invested in it. Yeah. Well, I mean, a lot of the times the things we're getting mad about isn't something the other one's doing. It's something your expert is saying or where they're behaving in a depot. But it's hard not to, like, pin it all on the lawyer that you see all the time in the case when it's not them. But, yeah, sometimes it flips to hot real fast and sometimes it happens gradually and you don't realize it right away. And the best thing to do when you do realize it is say, okay, we're taking a break. I got to get up. I got to get out of here because then I'm going to be saying things, and I have, that I shouldn't say. And then they have every right to be mad at me. So it's hard to monitor, especially when you have that Irish, Irish temper we have. And Tim has pulled me aside sometimes to give me advice like, hey, this ain't good for you. Quit getting so mad. Take a second. And I've appreciated it. I learned a lesson from Myron's Weebleman when I was a young lawyer. I wrote a letter to Myron on a discovery dispute, pretty spirited letter. It didn't contain any expletives deleted, but it was a spirited letter and it was snotty and it was snide. And I was in division one down in the city and Myron's Weebleman was in division one. And he came over and he sat down next to me and he said, Tim, how are you doing? And I said, I'm doing fine. And he says, I have something for you that I've been carrying with me. And I said, really, what is it? And he pulled out the letter that I wrote him and it had written it a few months before. And he said, just take a chance to read that, read that letter. And I read the letter and I couldn't believe that I wrote that letter. It was so snide, so snotty and he said, do you want that letter back? He says, because you could have that letter back and you can tear it up and throw it away. And what do you want to do? And I took the letter and I thanked him and I tore the letter up. And that was something early in my career that I thought of, okay, well, here's the rule on letters and emails. If you're making your point and you think you've got this perfect, perfect email or letter crafted that's going to just get that other side and make your point known. Watch well, away today, send it to one of your partners or associates or someone working with you. Give them a little context and guaranteed that letter's going to, our email is going to get modified or you're not going to send it. And I'm lucky that I have really good people around me who 
can see when I start to get agitated, can see when I start to get angry and feel comfortable enough. Even my secretary, my paralegals can say, you know what, you're agitated, what's wrong? I know it kind of sounds like we're all hotheads here, but to your point, Eric, the stress does rise for us, for all of us, your side, our side. So we got to have people helping us and point out and be comfortable enough to say to us, calm down. Maybe you shouldn't go to that deposition. Maybe I should go to the deposition. You hope that you have somebody next to you that can tell you, hey, step back. There's a lot of times, I'm sure all of us have sensed a temptation to go there, to get angry, and we're okay. But there's one thing that I don't know if I can control myself when I see it. And thank goodness it hasn't happened very much in my career. But when an opposing counsel says something that I know that they know is untrue, especially in front of a judge, especially about what I supposedly said where I did not say it, that's really hard for me to contain it. Maybe that would be a good example for like, what are some good strategies for how to deal with that kind of situation or something similar? I think one of the worst things you can do in front of a judge, because it just turns him off, is to call, you know, your colleague, another professional, another member of the bar, a liar. I think it turns judges off. They don't want to hear that. Talk about what you think, what evidence there is that supports why you're saying what you're saying instead of making personal attacks. In talking to judges, I've had judges just say, I know you probably didn't say that. And they know in their hearts that it's going to work out. So most of the time, if somebody's saying is misquoting me, I'll just say, that's not accurate. But you have to rely on the judges who, who know us. And most of the time we've been before them many times. But that is something you learn over time. You have to learn that over time. And when your first year or two out or a couple of years out, the first 10 years, when you hear somebody saying, attributing something to you that you didn't say in its material, first thing you want to do is correct it immediately. And that's when you start interrupting and something that you should never, really should never do. There's a... Uh many opportunities during depositions for people to feel frustrated. And I found on several occasions when I think the opposing counsel is losing control and getting heated or acting inappropriately, I think the last thing you want to do is correct them in front of everybody. And so I found that it's really best to take a break and find them in the hall and then reach out to them, even though you might be frustrated with them, reach out and ask them, if, are you okay? You look like you're frustrated in there. And I just want to make sure is everything going okay at home or, you know, it shows some concern. I have a recent story where something like that happened. A lawyer, I've had some other cases against, not your office, Tim, uh -huh. but I've had some cases with them and, you know, won some, lost some. So, yeah. you know, they're get they're built some frustration. And he was taking my expert's depot and was basically calling my client the L word, a liar over and over again to my expert. And I'd had enough. It was just like, look, you can, you can ask questions about consistencies between saying something once or twice, but like, you can't just sit here and call my client a liar over and over again. And he exploded and like stood up and screamed for like 20 minutes. And I thought I was doing him a favor. Like the judge isn't going to appreciate if we have to go talk to him that you just keep calling my client a liar. And he completely exploded. And he left for a half hour and came back to finish the deposition. And I asked him how he was doing and he didn't really want to talk about it. But I subsequently found out that there was some major things going on in his personal life. And I think that's what was going on. And I wish I'd made a little bit more of an effort when he had to take that break to say, look, whether you want to talk to me about it or not, it seems like there's something that's going on with you that maybe we should continue the depo and yeah. do it at another time. I think I argue less in depositions now than I did a few years ago. And when I've produced a witness, I've only stopped a deposition twice. And those are both times where the lawyer on the other side curse in conjunction with trying to, I think, harass a witness. So those are the only two times that I've ever stopped a deposition. Tim and I disagree over objections and what someone can say as far as an objection. Some people take the position you can only say object to the form. That's not a position that I take or I've been taught. And so we argue over that objection. And we argue that pretty much every single time. And I remember one time Tim said, all you can say is object to the form. 
you can't say anything more. Tim said, you're making a speaking objection. And I said to him, well, how am I supposed to make an objection? Am I supposed to send smoke signals or send up a flare? I need to speak. I want the court to understand the purpose of my objection. I'm not coaching. And I think I even got you to laugh at that one. Yeah, I think I did. <laughs> <laughs> but Eric, I think the point being at a deposition, witnesses should understand that it can become heated. It can become very spirited, but nobody should ever feel harassed or unsafe. And it rarely, rarely does that ever happen. And judges, the last thing that a judge wants to do is get a call to mediate some dispute or you come in on a motion a couple of weeks later for somebody's filed a motion for sanction and then somebody's filed a cross motion for sanctions and the judge is looking at it like, what is this about? It's a complete waste of time. Yeah. So you pretty much have to work it out on your own. Why don't we end by a uh, hypothetical young lawyer comes to your firm, high stakes case. What's your advice for young lawyers, how to keep your cool, keep the focus, get the job done? Try to remember that you should take a deep breath before you say anything. If you start feeling yourself getting angry. I mean, sometimes if I'm in a depot where I feel myself getting angry, I will literally write on a post-it note, take a breath. And it, it usually helps. That's the advice I got from another pretty prominent plaintiff's lawyer. I think he's from Tennessee and it works. Well, Mike Tyson once said, everyone's got a plan until <laughs> you, you get, get punched, punched in the, the face. face. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so right. that's what it takes sometimes. But I think what I tell them is listen more than talk, you know, listen more than you speak and take a few seconds to say what you're going to say. Thank you to both of you for joining me. This has been a good session. Thank you. Oh, for yeah. Me. Thank you. All right. That's been another episode of The Jury Is Out. This is Eric Beeth. See you next time. The Jury Is Out is brought to you by the Simon Law Firm. Share your comments with John and Eric at comments at thejuryisout.law. And if you want to look at the nation's first medical malpractice case against opioid overprescription, tune in to the other podcasts in the Simon Law Firm library in Results Don't Lie. And subscribe today because the best lawyers never stop learning.